Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on pathways to licensure. Next slide, please. I want to start by acknowledging that this webinar is being hosted on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, whose historical relationship with these lands continue to this day. We also acknowledge that all of you attending today remotely are located on Indigenous territories across the province. Just want to let you know that uh, questions will be answered following the presentation. And in order to submit questions, and you can do that at any time during the webinar, please use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will need to leave this webinar promptly at 757. Um, so just know that if you don't have a chance or we don't have a chance to answer your questions, we will provide you with an email address uh, to which you can send those questions and we will respond to any questions you have. Next slide, please. Just gonna start by going over the general licensure requirements and this is required for an applicant in any class. So we look for things like evidence of identification, experience, good professional conduct and good character. Any applicant needs to have a medical degree listed in the World Directory of Medical Schools, but also accepted in Canada. They need to meet the college's English language proficiency requirements. They need to be able to legally work in BC. Some other areas that we look at in applications are an applicant's currency and practice and their scope of practice. For currency and practice in BC, we look at what an applicant has done in the last three years. And it's critical that they have um, practiced for 24 weeks in their scope of practice and as, as that relates to their training. So an example I have of uh, where this sometimes becomes an issue in an application is if we have an applicant for family practice and they've only done long-term care in their uh, originating jurisdiction for the last three years. So if that's the case, they do have an opportunity to, to undergo retraining if they want to uh, practice in a, in a broader scope, uh, community-based practice. And we have a process for that, so, so we'd explain that. But if not, we would limit their scope of practice to that long-term care. So that's just an example of, of, of where those issues come up in an application at times. Next slide, please. In order for an applicant to be eligible for the full family class, they need to have their licensing exams. And in BC, we accept both the LMCC, which is the Licentiate of the Medical Council of Canada, or the United States Medical Licensing Exams, and the short form for that is the USMLEs. In addition to that, an applicant must meet at least one of the following requirements. And these requirements are different because the training has changed over the years. So they need to have obtained certification through the College of Family Physicians of Canada, or they need to be a graduate of a Canadian medical school in 1992 or earlier with a year of internship. Or if they did their postgraduate training between 1993 to 2010, you can see that there are other requirements listed here on the slide. Next slide, please. For the full specialty class, an applicant needs to again, um, have completed licensing exams, the LMCC or the USMLEs, and they need to have obtained certification in a primary specialty through the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Next slide. For eligibility for the provisional family class, an applicant needs to complete the Medical Council of Canada Part 1, and they need to meet at least one of the following requirements. If they have postgraduate training that's not uh, completed in Canada, uh, but is recognized by the College of Family Physicians of Canada, they may be eligible in this class. And currently the College of Family Physicians of Canada recognizes training in Australia, Ireland, the United Kingdom, and the USA. And so if an applicant has completed postgraduate training there, they can get awarded the CCFP without having to sit the examination in Canada. Or they need to have completed the postgraduate training in Canada, but they have yet to obtain that certification. And sometimes this is because a resident is off cycle. The third avenue is that they have undergone an accepted assessment of competency in Canada. There are a number of these in Canada and we do have a practice ready assessment program in British Columbia. And I'll speak to that uh, on the next slide. In order to facilitate the practice ready assessment program, um, there's a clinical component to that, a clinical assessment and it's 12 weeks long. And any applicant or candidate in that program needs to be licensed in the assessment class in order to complete that clinical assessment. And there are a number of requirements uh, from the PRABC program as well as from our bylaws for an applicant for the assessment class to meet. And those are listed here. Next slide, please. 
So the Practice Ready Assessment BC program provides an alternative path to provisional licensure in BC for those IMGs whose postgraduate training is not obtained in a jurisdiction acceptable to the College of Family Physicians of Canada. And those are the four that I spoke to earlier, the United Kingdom, Ireland, the US and Australia. Key partners in this program are the college, the provincial government, doctors of BC, UBC Faculty of Medicine, BC Health Authorities and Health Match BC. This program was launched in 2015, and to date it has assessed 188 family physicians and placed those in 57 communities throughout British Columbia. So it's been a real success. Next slide, please. In order for an applicant to be eligible for the provisional specialty class, they need to again have completed their licensing exam, the part one or the USMLEs. They need to meet one of the following requirements, have obtained their Royal College certification, completed accredited postgraduate training in Canada, but yet but have yet to obtain certification. Again, sometimes we have residents who are off cycle, they're not finishing um, with their cohort, and that could be for a number of reasons. Parental leave is just one example that comes to mind. Um, or they have completed their postgraduate training outside of Canada. They've completed, they've received a completion of training or certificate, and they're eligible through the Royal College um, to sit the exams through a, a route that's recognized by our registration committee. The fourth uh, way is that they have undergone an assessment of competency in Canada. In BC, we currently don't have an assessment program for specialists, but um, for example, Alberta does. So if there's a physician who's completed that in Alberta as on the register, our committee actually recognizes that assessment that they completed in Alberta as an example. Next slide, please. We do have a number of other classes, podiatric surgeon, osteopathic, academic, Associate Physician, um, this is a class that's not for independent practice, and I'm just gonna to speak to this on the next slide. So the purpose of this uh, Associate Physician class is really to provide an opportunity for those physicians that don't qualify for another um, class of licensure to be able to, to practice here, but it's under supervision. So they're equivalent to a resident in terms of the kind of work they do and the supervision they have. In order to be eligible, they do need to have an employment um, contract with the health authority. So they are employees of the health authority. So that's why we have the requirement for the sponsorship letter. And in order to be eligible for this class, they need to have completed a minimum of two years of accredited training as a medical or surgical specialist prior to applying for registration. And again, have successfully completed the, uh, um, the part one of the Medical Council of Canada qualifying exam. And I'm um, happy to say that they also have to work in accredited programs and the college is responsible for that accreditation. And we've recently uh, are in the process of completing a number of those. So we expect to see the uptake uh, on associate physician registrations happening uh, in the coming months. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna speak briefly about the application process. Next slide. In March of this year, we introduced a fast track licensure to eligible uh, applicants. And really they have to be applicants for full and they have to meet the requirements that are listed on this slide. If they meet these requirements, there is a lot less paperwork, um, whether it's electronic or uh, real paper that they have to provide to the college because we are counting on a different jurisdiction in Canada to have done that work. And what we've seen so far, uh, our experience to date is that the average processing time is taking two weeks less for fast tracked over the regular application process. So that seems to be successful to date. Next slide, please. The application for provisional uh, registration is quite a bit longer and there's a number of reasons for that. We do uh, a pre-assessment at the staff level. And then we also, um, once we've done that pre-assessment, we take the file to our registration committee for review and they issue an eligibility letter. The pre-assessment really tells an applicant physician whether is it worth pursuing? Is eligibility going to be likely? What additional documents will the, will the registration committee likely need to see in order to determine their eligibility? So this could be anything from credentials like their completion of training certificate, their um, uh, they need to show that they meet the English language proficiency requirements, and those are just two examples. Once the file goes before the registration committee, the committee will determine whether they're eligible, and we, they issue what we call an eligibility ruling, which will have subjects. So there's kind of two parts. First, the, the applicant has to meet the subjects, and then once those subjects are met, they get the secondary part of the application process. The eligibility ruling from the registration committee is valid for three years, and there's a, a number of reasons for that. Uh, number one, the applicant physician needs to navigate the immigration, immigration process to be able to legally work in BC. 
Um, they need to find a role. Do they have sponsorship? Will they be able to get sponsorship from a health authority? Often they need to wind down a practice in their home jurisdiction. They have family that they need to move um, and circumstances over that three year period may change for the applicant physician. They may you know, apply for an eligibility ruling, but during that three year validity period, things might happen in their life where they say, no, this isn't the right choice for me to, to pursue this. If it's expired, they can reapply for, for a new eligibility ruling. Next slide, please. So this just shows um, the pre-screening. So that's the pre-screening assessment I spoke to earlier. Next. And then the preliminary assessment request. So this is really when we get all the documentation from either Health Match PC, which does a lot of the, the recruitment. So they often provide packages for candidates. There's third party recruiters or a physician can just contact the college directly and work with us. An online application is completed. We do the eligibility review that I spoke about. We let the uh, candidate physician know what we think, what other, what other paperwork we need to see or the registration committee needs to see. Next, please. It goes to the registration committee for review. So the time between the preliminary assessment request, the eligibility review and committee is about four to eight weeks. And then next, please. Once the eligibility ruling is um, issued by the registration committee and all the subjects are met, we issued the secondary application package, which includes the um, application form, which has a lot of questions like the annual license renewal form for registrants who fill that out annually. As well, we need certificates of professional conduct from other jurisdictions where the applicant physician has practiced. We process the application. Next, please. And then it's registration and licensure. So from the secondary application package to registration, we usually advise candidate physicians that that can take up to eight weeks. And um, sometimes that time is extended for a number of reasons, which I'll talk about on the next slide, please. So what are some challenges we see with applications? One is that we do need certain credentials uh, verified, things like medical degree, postgraduate training, if it's outside of Canada, we do have those source verified. And the source verification is done through Physicians Apply. And that process, depending on where the documents originate from, can take some time as you can appreciate. Also receiving third-party documentation takes time. Sometimes it's the sponsorship letters, reference forms, certificates of professional conduct, especially when we're needing these from countries that where there may um, be situations where it's harder to get certificates of professional conduct just because there might be unrest in that country or civil war as an example. And then work permits. Uh, we need to wait for the candidate to, to have, to show us that they can legally work in BC. The other application challenge at times can be where there's affirmative answers on applications. So we ask a number of questions about, do you have any outstanding legal issues in the home jurisdiction? And those could be uh, criminal issues that are not related to medical practice. Um, there could be issues in the other jurisdictions, an open complaint is an example, or the candidate could have health issues. And for all these um, affirmative answers, we do need to do follow up just to ensure that we have close that loop and that there's no issues in terms of potential patient safety if, if we were to register that physician. And also we wanna make sure that the physician has the supports that they need. For example, if there is a health issue um, that they also have the support they need from here um, in order to practice um, safely. Next slide, please. And that uh, concludes this, this webinar. Um, we've asked you to submit questions. Just a reminder, you can submit them at the bottom of the page. We have the question and answer button. Um, you can check our website and we also have provided you here with an email address. So feel free to email us and we will get back to you with answers as soon as possible. And I'm going to hand it over to Susan to, to moderate the questions. Thanks, Karen, and thank you to those of you who have already submitted a question. Uh, we have about uh, 10 or so minutes left and we will get through as many as we can. Uh, and then as Karen said, uh, if you have questions that we don't get to, please do email them to, to us at registration at cpspc.ca. So the first question, Corrine, is, is it mandatory to have a permanent residency or citizenship to apply for jobs in British Columbia? So ultimately, if you wanna be registered here, you have to be able to legally work here. But if you're going through the application process, you can do that process separately. And if you work with an organization like Health Match BC, they do actually navigate, help you navigate that process. But by the time you get to the registration stage, you do need to have a work permit or permanent residency or Canadian citizenship in order to, to, be, to be registered. 
The second question is, how is the college facilitating physicians, especially family practice physicians, who have less team support to get a license and return to practice after prolonged leave, such as maternity leave? In other words, they do not have currency of practice. Great question. We do have provisions in the bylaw that allow for, for any um, registrant. Sometimes we have registrant in that situation where they lose their currency or even an applicant. We do have provisions where they can propose a retraining program to the college. We have certain parameters around that in terms of you know, it needing to be in a group practice. They need to have the supports. And that proposal is put forward to the college. The college reviews it. We approve both the proposal and the um, person who will be the physician who will be having oversight of that retraining. And once it's approved, then um, that physician will get a license to complete that retraining. And then we get reports from that supervising physician. And at the end of that period of time, the agreed upon period of time, if it's successful, then we consider that physician to be current in practices and then encourage them to maintain that. Thank you. If residency was done outside of Canada, example cardiology, but the um, applicant has two advanced fellowships in Canada and currently is a fellow at UBC, uh, would they be considered eligible to practice without having to repeat a residency? Yeah, it's difficult to take a situation like unless I can see all the credentials. I guess that's the, the business I'm in here. Um, but I think the best thing to do in that case is to work with a partner like HealthMatch BC or contact us directly. Give us all your credentials. We can do that preliminary. There is a cost to that preliminary assessment, but we can do that preliminary assessment. And that's really the purpose of that is to look at all the documentation and information and give that candidate uh, physician the best you know information we can to say you're likely going to be eligible or here's what we still need to see. Um, you also would need an eligibility ruling from the Royal College through one of the accepted routes, the approved jurisdiction route or the practice eligibility route um, in order to um, prior to, to, to us being able to say for sure that you're eligible because we really do look to those national bodies for that. The next question, what is the role of physician apply in BC registration if the college staff takes months to re-verify documents that are already source verified? This is particularly for physicians who've trained in the UK whose documentation should be easily verified. Yeah, I haven't heard of that. So I'd be really, you know, if you can email um, registration at cpsbc.ca and, and let me know any specifics, because I'd like to look into an issue like that. If it and, and if it exists, we would do things to address that, because normally if it is in Physicians Apply and it's been verified, we actually have access to Physician Apply. And with the Physician Candidate's permission, we can view those documents so they don't need to be re-verified. So it's only a, a one-time verification. So if there are challenges in that process, I'd certainly be open to hearing about them so that we could address that because that, that shouldn't be happening. Thank you. Will British Columbia be starting a practice assessment pathway at some point? We do have a practice assessment pathway, but only through the practice ready assessment program. And that is focused on family physicians. And that's not uh, the college doesn't own that program. We are a key partner who work with the practice ready assessment program. Um, so that's the only one we have at this time. And, and any other kind of assessment program, that's really a broader discussion um, with key partners outside of the college as well. Thank you. For the provisional class of family medicine, is the MCC QE1 required if an applicant has completed all three USMLE exams? No, MVC, our uh, registration committee has said that it will accept the US MLEs in lieu of the LMCC, so. Can, can we work with other provinces in the future in order to come up with a plan for one national licensure system? Yeah, great question. Um, and we do have a national body where we all meet and try and align our processes as much as possible. And we have model standards that we try to achieve. As you can appreciate, we um, live in a federal provincial uh, country. And so currently the health portfolio is provincial. So that certainly raises some unique challenges and we do have some different, we do have different requirements from province to province, but it's certainly a current topic that uh, we're aware of. Heidi, did you wanna add anything? Yeah, um, certainly from a regulatory point of view, we would welcome national licensure. We just have very significant constitutional issues to overcome for that. I think the jurisdiction that has um, 
um, successfully shown us that we can move to a national license is Australia, where they moved from uh, state-based licensure to one license and you can work anywhere in Australia. So um, if, if we could get there, we would welcome it. Uh, we are not the barrier to getting to national licensure. And uh, I think that it would actually be an opportunity to fundamentally change the healthcare system in Canada completely by moving to a single licensure. And uh, But those are really decisions that rest with our provincial government, the federal government, as well as the territorial government. Could you, uh, Corinne, just review the academic registration pathway and, and speak to whether or not it's comparable to full specialty registration? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you might want to... Um, if you email registr the registration email, I can, I can send you um, a checklist kind of we have for that provision. It has three different areas, sections. That's really meant for academic appointments. So UBC is involved with that. We need a letter from UBC saying that the candidate um, is going to be in a particular academic position that's at a certain level. Um, so two of the provisions, the applicant physician could only work 40% clinically. The third one, they could work more than that, but our registration committee has to find on the basis of all the evidence put before it that there's adequate ad academic output. Um, so that's definitely uh, worth having a further conversation for the person who's asking that question. So please reach out to that registration inbox and I'm happy to follow up on that. So it is a pathway as long as, it is in, as that physician is working in an academic setting and meeting all the requirements of that section. Thank you. And the next question, what are the requirements for overseas trained specialists, uh, for example, from Australia for a locum 12 month job in British Columbia? Yeah, so that really comes back to the full uh, for the provisional specialty class. So so that kind of a that physician candidate would have to meet all those requirements. So get the eligibility from the Royal College for the specialty they have or have that certification already. They would need to uh, meet the requirements for have the LMCC, the MCCQE part one. So um, that's in the slide deck that uh, we provided. And I can certainly, again, email the registration inbox and I can certainly put that in an email. Next question is, will British Columbia be following Ontario in terms of not requiring QE1 for family medicine licensing? Our bylaws currently require it. And um, so it is, it continues to be a requirement. Um, at this point, I don't see that um, that requirement will be waived. Why does BC registration take longer to obtain when compared to other provinces? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And we do discuss timelines with our colleagues and we are aligned with our colleagues across the country um, with in terms of timelines for getting registered. So uh, when we have individual situations, if there's challenges, we encourage both the applicant or any physician supporting them just to email. And if there are any issues that we can address, we do address those. But we are in line with other jurisdictions in Canada. Thank you. And can the USMLE Step 2 replace the MCCQE Part 1 for a Canadian applicant? Yeah, at this time, it has to be the full suite of USMLE's exams that replaces any part of the um, LMCC. Can you comment on the current route for a specialist on a provisional licensure to, to transition to a full license? Can you repeat that question, Susan? Yeah. Um, the current route for a specialist who's on a provisional license to transition to full license. Mm -hmm. So um, any specialist who's in the provisional class would need to uh, obtain their certification, their primary specialty through the Royal College. They would have to um, have a period of practice where we've had a satisfactory supervisor report because they are under sponsorship and supervision. And they have to complete what we call the BC Physician Integration Program. And that's usually within the first six months of their registration. And that program is really about um, the BC healthcare system in terms of prescribing, it has modules on uh, cultural safety. And so we get evidence that that has been com completed. It's done through the, the UBC Continuing Medical Education Program. And once that has all been completed, they would be eligible to move to the full class. I feel like you might have answered this one, but perhaps there's a nuance to it. Can you speak more about the academic route to practice? Who's eligible? Are you still el eligible for this route if you also meet the requirements to sit the Royal College specialty exams? Yeah, so um, you are still eligible if you sit 
if you are if you're currently in the provisional or class or if you are eligible for the provisional class the key components of that academic there are certain requirements like i noted ubc has to write a letter of support you have to be in an academic position you have to either be practicing less than 40% uh, clinical and or you have to show that there's adequate academic output. Again, reach out to the registration at cpsbc.ca. I will provide more specific information because it is a complex um, class of licensure and there are a number of requirements that I just can't cover off in, in this question and answer period. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate we just have a few more minutes because we do have our annual general meeting starting promptly at 8 a.m. this morning. Uh, and so we will not get to all of your questions, but we will uh, put this webinar up on the website and we will have a full Q&A also to accompany the webinar on the website. So hopefully we will get uh, answers to all of your questions. Um, but the next one is, and I am doing these in order, I'm working as a family physician on a two year work permit in the provisional class. Do I have to wait to get permanent residency before I can apply to convert my license to a full license? No, the answer to that is no, you don't. As long as you have eligibility to legally work and practice in BC, you don't have to have permanent residency. You just have to continue to have your work permit until. The next one is regarding, uh, I believe the practice ready assessment for IMGs. One of the requirements is a two year internship, which is not applicable to everyone. Is there any chance that this will change? Yeah, like I noted in my um, webinar, the PRABC program is really separate from the college, like we don't own that program. So I would encourage you to connect with that program and put that question to them if that's something they're going to explore. I know they're aligned with the national um, practice ready assessment um, standards. So that's where in part that comes from, but other jurisdictions I know in Canada don't have that two years. So it would be worth following up with the program about that. And I think this is referring to the application process. Is it different for a practicing physician who is retired and wants to get back to work after one or two years? Uh, it is, uh, it's the same, but different. <laughs> if you have uh, practiced in BC before and you're reapplying, if you have retired for a few years, we will have all your information on file. So it'll be a lot easier process. We're not going to ask you to redo everything that we already have. So in that case, it's um, more streamlined. Of course, we'd have to look at the currency and practice piece just to make sure that that applicant is still current in practice. If, for example, you just retired in the last three months from our register, there's a very we have a shorter application form and process just to facilitate that. If you're coming from a different jurisdiction, it is unfortunately the same process as applying anew, unless you meet uh, the requirements for ex uh, for fast track licensure. Thank you. I, I have a couple of questions here that are very specific to individuals, unique uh, circumstances. And I would suggest that if you have questions with regards to your very unique circumstance, that again, you take the opportunity to uh, email Corrine directly. Um, one last question, and then I think we'll wrap up. Uh, would provisional registration or an associate physician be eligible to function as a surgical assistant? Yeah, so certainly for associate physician, if that's what the accredited program wants to use associate physicians for, um, they definitely could. They would write the job description for that. And was the other class provisional, Susan? Is that what you? Yeah. So generally provisional is meant to fill vacancies in BC. So we don't see a lot of surgical assistant, like the whole role would be surgical assisting. That's not to say that um, a physician in the provisional class won't as part of their practice do surgical assisting. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have to wrap up this webinar now. Again, really appreciate all of you attending so early in the morning. We will take note of all of your questions and we will endeavor to get them all answered on our website. Um, again, thank you, Corinne, and, uh, and uh, hope some of you will join us at our annual general meeting next, starting at 8 a.m. Thank you.